Welcome to the 24th lecture in the series, Introduction to New Testament Textual Criticism. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your people the fruit of the Spirit. Influence us to long to be more loving, modeling your love. Make us more joyful as we re remember your promises to us. Make us peaceful in light of the peace you have provided. Make us patient, kind, and good, seeking to conform to the image of your Son. Make us gentle, seeking to represent your kingdom in every circumstance and give us self-control, that all our actions may be guided by our awareness of your presence. Th through your Son, Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, we're investig investigating one of the most controversial areas in the field of New Testament textual criticism, the creation and adoption of conjectural emendations. A conjectural emendation is a reading that is, that is not directly supported by any witnesses. Conjectural emendations are driven by the premise that on some rare occasions, the reading that accounts best for all other readings is a reading that is not extant. Even in the earliest days of the printed text of the Greek New Testament, some conjectural emendations were proposed. In James 4.2, Erasmus did not think that it was plausible that the readers of James's letter would kill. So he introduced the idea that James originally wrote that his letters recipients were envious. Erasmus's conjecture influenced some future translations, including Martin Luther's translation and the 1557 Geneva translation. By the late 1700s, so many conjectural emendations had been proposed that a printer named William Bowyer collected them in a book in 1772 that was over 600 pages long, titled Critical Conjectures and Observations on the New Testament. Many of the conjectures were apologetically driven and resolved his, his, his historical questions rather than textual ones, and many others implied an almost magical stupidity on the part of copyists. But in 1881, when Westcott and Hort printed their Greek New, New, Test New Testament, they were willing to grant the possibility that 60 passages in the New Testament contain a primitive corruption, where only by conjecture could the original reading be recovered. Other scholars have argued for the adoption of non extant readings in a few other places. We're not going to look into each and every one of those 60 passages today, but we will look into some of, some of them, especially the ones that have affected some English translations. One of the earliest conjectural emendations is from Ammonius of Alexandria, from the 200s, whose proposal was passed along by Eusebius of Caesarea and others. Ammonius suggested a conjectural emendation could harmonize Mark's statement in Mark 15.25 that Jesus was crucified at the third hour, and John's statement in John 19.14 that Jesus was being sentenced by Pilate at the sixth hour. Rather than imagine that different methods of our reckoning were involved, 
Ammonius proposed that the text of John 19.14 contains an ancient error, and that the Greek numeral gamma, which stands for three, was misread as if it was the obsolete letter digamma, which stands for six. Some copyist apparently thought that this must be correct, and wrote the Greek equivalent of Mark of sixth in Mark's 1525, and a few others, including Codex L and Codex Delta, had scribes who wrote the equivalent of third in John 1914. Another early church writer, Tertullian, proposed that the extant reading of John 113 is not the original reading. In chapter 19 of his composition, On the Flesh of Christ, he insisted that the reading that is found in our New Testaments is the result of heretical tampering, and that the verse initially re referred specifically to Christ. Not only Tertullian, but also Irenaeus, and the author of the little-known Epistula Apostolorum, appear to cite John 1, 13 with a singular subject rather than a plural one. No reading that is supported exclusively by papyri has been adopted in place of readings that were already extant, but a reading in Papyrus 66 comes very close to doing so. William Bowyer's 1772, 1772 book included a theory that had become that had been expressed by Dr. Henry Owen about John 752. Owen had written, The Greek text, I apprehend, is not perfectly right, and our English version has carried it still further from its true meaning. Is it possible that Jews could say that out of Galilee hath arisen no prophet, when several no less perhaps than six, of their own province were natives of that country. I conclude that what they really said, and what the reading ought to be, was that the prophet is not to arise out of Galilee, from whence they supposed Jesus to have sprung. Well, the key proponent of Owen's proposal was vindicated by the discovery of Papyrus 66, which has the Greek equivalent of the before the word prophet, just what Owen thought was the original reading. Some commentators have considered it implausible that John would report in John 1929 that the soldiers at the crucifixion would offer to Jesus a sponge filled with sour wine upon a stick of hyssop. In 1572, Joachim Camerarius the Elder proposed that originally John had written about a javelin or a spear and that after this had been expressed by the words whoso properithentes, scribes mangled, mangled the, the, the text so as to produce the reference to hyssop. This conjecture, which was modified by, by Beza, uh, was adopted by the scholars who made the New English Bible New Testament in 1961. In Acts 7.46, textual critics have to choose between the reading of most manuscripts, which is the st statement that David allowed, asked to be allowed to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, and the statement that David asked to be allowed to find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob, which is the reading in the Nestle Allen compilation. The second reading is more difficult because it seems to say that 
David asked to build a house for a house. Even when the second house is understood to refer to the nation descended, descended from Jacob, the problem does not go away. Since the temple was for God, not for the people, who were not looking for a place to reside in the days of David. In 1881, Hort proposed that oiko can hardly be genu genu genuine, but instead of accepting the Byzantine reading, he, can he conjectured that neither reading is original, and that the original text was tokurio, the, the Lord, which was contracted, and then inattentive copyist misread it as to oiko. In Acts 16, 12, Bruce Metzger was overruled by the other editors of the United Bible Society's committee, and an imaginary reading was adopted into the UBS compilation. Protes was adopted instead of Protes Tes Meridas so as to mean that Philippi was a first city of the district, dist, district of Macedonia. Metzger insisted that the extant text was capable of being translated as a leading city of the district of Macedonia. Metzger also dedicated two full pages of his textual commentary on the Greek New Testament to consider the variance in Acts 20.12, excuse me, Acts 20.28. Did the original text refer to the Church of God, or to the Church of the Lord, or to the Church of the Lord and God? The contest between God and Lord amounts to the difference of a single letter. If we set aside the Byzantine reading, once the sacred names are contracted, it's a contest between Theta Upsilon and Kappa Upsilon. If the contest is decided in favor of Theta Upsilon, then a second question arises. Did Luke report that Paul stated that God purchased the church with his own blood? Many apologists have used this verse to demonstrate Paul's advocacy of the divinity of Christ. Hort, however, expressed the suspicion of an earlier scholar, George Christian Knapp, Knapp, that at the end of the verse, after the words, through his own blood, there was originally the word, wow, son. The contemporary version, advertised as an accurate and faithful translation of the original manuscripts, seems to adopt this conjecture. It has the word son in its text of Acts 20, 28b. Be like shepherds to God's church. It is the flock that he bought with the blood of his own son. Hmm. Well, the Greek evidence is in agreement about how 1 Corinthians 6.5 ends. But the Peshitta disagrees. The reading in the Peshitta implies that its Greek-based text included the phrase Kai, Tau, Adelphal, and a brother. The first part of Paul's state statement in this verse is something to the effect of, Is there not even one person among you? Just one who shall be able to judge between. And that's where the difficulty appears. The Greek text mentions just one brother, whereas the idea of judgment between two parties seems to demand that more than one brother should be mentioned. Although the text is receptus has the equivalent of between his brother, which is clearly sing singular, the KJB's translators conclu concluded the verse with between his brethren, which is clearly plural. The CSB, the NIV, and the NASB likewise render the text as if the verse ends with a plural word 
rather than a singular one. All such treatments of the text make the problem all the more obvious. The first part of the sentence in Greek anticipates true brothers, while the second part of the sentence mentions only one. In light of this internal evidence, and the evidence from the Peshitta, Michael Holmes, the compiler of the SBL GNT, commended the adoption of a conjectural emendation of this at this point, so that Kai Tau Adelfal appears at the very end of the verse. A fairly recent development in textual criticism is the tendency to regard 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, as if it is not, or, not original, even though the words are in every manuscript of 1 Corinthians. In a few manuscripts, they appear after verse 40. The usual form of this conjecture is that the words began as a marginal note and were gradually adopted into the text. Gordon Fee adopted this view in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, and it has grown in popularity since then, especially among interpreters who favor an egalitarian view on the question of gender roles in the church. One of the interesting aspects of this issue is the impact and importance of the double dots, or diastigmae, that appear in the margin of Codex Vaticanus to signify a variation between the, te the, the, the text of that manuscript and the text in some other document. A much older scholarly debate has orbited the phrase, Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, in Galatians 4.25. The sentence is included in the Nestle Allen compilation. However, it has been proposed that the entire phrase originated as a marginal note. This phrase goes back at least to the early 1700s with R Richard Bentley. Uh, more recently, Stephen Carlson has argued, argued in favor of the same idea. In Hebrews 1137, as the sufferings by spiritual heroes are listed, list, listed, one of those things is not like the others. They are all somewhat unusual experiences, except for they were tempted. Some textual critics have suspected that the words that the word epirastethesan originated when the copyist committed dithography, writing one, writing twice. What should be read, read once, in this case the preceding word, that means they were sawn in two. And that subsequent copyists changed the repeated word into something mean, meaningful. Others have thought that this relatively common term replaced one that was less common. Perhaps another word that means they were pierced, a word that means they were sold. Presently, the Nestle Allen compilation deviating from the 25th edition, simply does not include Epibastasin in the text, following Papyrus 66. But Papyrus 13 appears to support the inclusion of Epibastasin, and it has a very impressive list of allies. I would advise readers to not get used to the current form of this verse in the critical text, for it may be merely a placeholder that could be blown away by the appearance of new evidence or slightly different an analysis. In 1 Peter 3.19 we find the most popular conjectural emendation of all time. This was favored by the te textual expert J. Rendell Harris who encountered a very brief form of it in William Bowyer's book. The extant text of 1 Peter 3.19 says, In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. 
Verse 18 refers to Christ, and nobody else is introduced into the text. So verse 19 has been meant to, has been understood to mean that during the time between Jesus' death and resurrection, he visited the realm of the dead and visited the spirits of those who had been disobedient in the days of Noah prior to the great flood and delivered a message to them. However, Harris proposed the original text was different. He thought that Peter had in mind a scene that is related in the pseudepigraphical book of Enoch. In this text, Enoch is pictured depicting a message of condemnation to the fallen spirits who corrupted human beings so thoroughly that the great flood was introduced as the means of amputating the moral infection they had induced. Harris proposed... Harris proposed that the opening words of the original text of 319 were Enochai Enoch, in which also Enoch. Assigning the subsequent action not to Christ, but to Enoch. There are two ways in which the name Enoch could have fallen out of the sentence. If the original text was simply Enoch, without in Hokai, in Hokai, then in magical script, the Kai was susceptible to being misread as an abbreviation for the word Kai, and a copyist could easily decide to write the whole word instead of the abbreviation, and thus Enoch's name would become in Hokai. The second possibility is that the original text were in Hokai, Enoch, and a copyist could read the Kai as an abbreviation for Kai, and the scribe who made his exemplar inadvertently repeated three words. That's the assumption that the copyist would make. And attempting a correction, he would then remove the word Enoch. Against the charge that the introduction of Enoch's name disturbs the otherwise smooth context, the answer is that a reference to Enoch is not out of place inasmuch as Enoch's, Enoch's story sets the stage for the story of Abraham, excuse me, for the story of Noah and his family, whose deliverance through water Peter frames as a pattern of salvation. If this doctrinal emendation, if, if this conjectural emendation were adopted, it would have at least a little bit of doctrinal impact by diminishing the biblical basis for the phrase he descended into hell that is found in the Apostles' Creed. And finally, in 1 Peter 3.10, we encounter an imaginary Greek reading that has been adopted into the text of the 28th edition of the Nestle Island Greek New Testament. Rejecting the assortment of contending variants offered by the Greek manuscripts, the editors have preferred the reading that is implied by reading for which the external support is only extant in Coptic and Syriac. However, the judgment of the scholars who gave up on the extant Greek readings may have been premature. The text is sufficiently clear with the reading will be found. While this is also puzzling enough to provoke attempts at simplification. Only two of these conjectural emendations are mentioned in the 28th edition of the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament. The 27th edition was the last one to include conjectural emendations in its textual apparatus. Some readers may be taken aback by the idea that some of the inspired words in the Word of God can only be reconstructed by the imagination of scholars. A realistic pushback against the idea of adopting any conjectural emendation is the question, does it really seem feasible that every scribe 
in every transmission stream got it wrong. If scholars reject singular readings simply because they're singular, the non-existent readings should be even more disqualified as a point of consistency. It also seems very inconsistent to criticize advocates of poorly attested readings only to turn around and advocate readings with zero external Greek-Greek support. It has been said by some very influential textual critics that New Testament textual criticism is both an art and a science. But it should be all science and not art because it, it is an enterprise of reconstruction, not construction. Its methods may validly be creative and inventive and even intuitive, but not its product. Conjectural emendation is the only aspect of, of textual, criticism, textual criticism that potentially involves the researcher's artistic or creative skill. In my view, no conjectural emendation should ever be placed in a compilation of the text of the Greek New Testament. At the same time, the task of proposing conjectural emendations as possible readings which account for the rivals serves a valuable purpose to demonstrate the heavy weight of internal evidence in favor of such readings in the event that they are discovered in an actual Greek manuscript. Thank you.